Hi, I'm Rhonda Pennington, your instructor for this mini course about civic participation. Today, we're going to define civic participation. We're going to look at some opportunities you have in the community for participating and getting involved. And also, we will look at how civic participation is actually mutually beneficial, not just to the community, but to yourself. I have 11 slides here for us to review briefly for your lecture for this mini course. And I will attach a PDF of these slides to your course material. So if you need to refer back, you don't have to listen to me talk again, and you don't have to listen to the whole thing to get to one part. You are free to look it up. So let's get started. What is civic participation? Civicus is Latin for the word citizen. And participation means to partake or share in. So civic participation then would be citizens who partake or share in the responsibilities of their communities. And there are lots of ways that you can participate as far as uh, participating in your community. You can attend a parent-teacher conference. You can help with a parade float. Maybe you could walk in the Relay for Life, donate to a charity or thrift store, and even voting counts as civic participation. So there are lots of ways that you can get involved that don't have to be super organized and you don't have to be part of a super big group either. Which leads us to talk about the four kinds of civic participation. Individual, group, formal, and informal. In individual civic participation, you know, some of these examples are like voting, when you go cast your ballot, when you donate items to the thrift store, or maybe you make a donation to a charity. Group participation would be something that involves exactly what it says, a group, right? So you're campaigning for a candidate, you're organizing something. Maybe you're part of band boosters, and so that's definitely a group that gets involved. Coaching a ball team or volunteering with a, a charitable organization. And there are formal and informal kinds of civic participation. So formal is generally with others, like in a civic club or as in campaigning for a candidate, like we talked about with the groups. Informal is on your own, that individual kind of civic participation where maybe you didn't really intend to make a donation to the thrift store, but when you started cleaning out your closet, you realized, hey, there's some stuff here that other people could still get some good use out of doesn't fit me anymore, or I never used it, I haven't used it in the last five years, so I'm just going to donate that. That's spontaneous. Or maybe you set out to clean out your kid's room, you know, and you tell your child, you're going to help me clean out your room, and we're going to go through all your toys, and whatever you don't use anymore, we are going to donate. So that's kind of planned. Another example of an informal civic participation might be like, uh, if your child has a birthday party coming up, and instead of asking for gifts, they ask for donations to the Humane Society. Or if you are a Facebook user, you've probably seen that as birthdays come up, people set a cause for the birthday and ask people to donate for it. That is an informal kind of civic participation. Obviously, the community benefits from civic participation, whether it's a um, club that's donating money to a particular group, or a thrift store that benefits from any items that you've donated to it. The community as a whole benefits because then um, they have this growing community. And we'll talk a little more about that with social cohesion in just a minute. But what I really want to point out here is that yes, while community and organizations benefit from it, so do you. Volunteers individually benefit from civic participation. Generally speaking, people who get involved in civic activities are more physically and emotionally active. It expands the resources, kind of networking, you get to know more people, and it provides a sense of purpose. And all of those things are called social capital. That's where clubs and trusted people that coordinate or cooperate for mutual benefit. So, while you may not go into it with that frame of mind, that's a benefit that you get from it when you volunteer. And social capital, that social capital that we just talked about, is an indicator of something called social cohesion. 
Social cohesion is very important to communities. It's the strength of relationships and unity in a community. It's what makes a community stronger. And that social capital that we just talked about is very important because it's an indicator of social cohesion. And social cohesion is the strength of relationships or unity in a community, which is very important for communities that want to grow because uh, there's this feeling of camaraderie, of knowing that you can uh, get help from a fellow neighbor, that sort of thing that develops when you have this social cohesion. If a community has volunteers, they are vested in that community. They're working to make that community a better place. Social networks also benefit participants, like networking for jobs, moral support, emotional support, and instrumental support, like if my car breaks down, I could call someone maybe from an organization that I know have gotten to know really well and say, hey, can I catch a ride with you to school? So there are benefits like that that really just are hard to measure. So in terms of social capital, that's how we try to measure social cohesion. There are four elements that help us measure it. Perceived fairness, perceived helpfulness, group membership, and trust. So group membership here doesn't mean that uh, you have to be part of a particular organization or anything like that. What it talks about or what it means is that you feel like you're part of something bigger. Let's say, let's take a food bank for example and say maybe your family has recently fallen up on hard times and um, you need a little help until things get better. And so you're trying to get up the nerve to make your first trip to the food bank. When you get there, if you are treated with helpful attitudes and fairness, that makes you feel like part of that group. Even though you're the recipient and they are the giver, you're still part of something bigger and that helps develop trust and that's why those four measures are of social capital are so important to social cohesion. There are a lot of local groups that help develop social cohesion in our own region and I didn't get very specific here but rather stayed kind of general because you know, our service area is large, and I want you to know that you could look for any of these organizations in your communities. Kiwanis Club generally helps um, with children's funds. Rotary focuses on health, energy sustainability, and home building. Lions Club focuses on improvement for eyesight and glasses for people who are in need. Historical societies provide local history preservation. Church groups share religion, they share various charities like food banks, Christmas gifts, food drives, all of that sort of thing. Stop animal cruelty or humane societies help with pets and animal needs. And of course, Habitat for Humanity focuses on housing. Those people are always looking for members or volunteers. On campus, we have Student Government Association that creates various projects throughout the year. Honors College, takes on a project each year and they raise money for a particular project that they decide upon and make a donation to that with whatever their project proceeds bring in. Then TRIO offers a food pantry and some other needs too for students who might need some assistance and Career Pathways offers help for parents who are students. So community involvement doesn't have to just be in the community, it can be in your campus community as well. So there are lots of types of civic participation, as I mentioned. Protesting is another one of those. Protesters have rights that are protected by the Constitution. Counter-protesters also have rights that are also protected by the Constitution, which infuriates people a lot of times. You know, if you want to go protest, that you're going to have a counter-protest contingency there as well, trying to detract attention from your cause but it happens all the time and honestly that's why it happens you know people trying to detract um, attention from whatever your cause is police must treat both equally the American Civil Liberties Union recommends that protests happen in traditional public locations like at public buildings 
on public sidewalks and in public parks. You can also protest in streets because they're public, but they're protected. Protesters may be asked to move or may be removed if they're blocking um, an intended purpose, like if they're blocking a street and that interferes with traffic control or public safety, then those concerns will impede the rights of the protesters. When you are legally at a public place, you have the right to photo or video anyone or anything in plain view at that public place. Now, not on private property, that's up to the property owner. But if you are at a public location, then you have the right to photo or video anyone or anything in plain view. That can be important if um, maybe your rights are being violated or you think they're being violated or you see someone whose rights may be uh, violated. The ACLU points out that it's legal to photo or video anyone or anything in plain view. I've already mentioned that voting is a way to get involved in your community. In order to vote in Arkansas, you have to be a U.S. citizen and a resident of our state. You have to be 18 or turn 18 by election day. And if you're a convicted felon, your sentence must be discharged or pardoned in order to be able to vote. You need to not be mentally incompetent for voting. The application process is really simple. It's a two-page voter registration application, and you submit that to the Secretary of State or to your local county clerk. And voting is just as easy as registering to vote. You actually have several options. Early voting is usually held a week to two weeks before the election, seven to 15 days, at a central location, often the courthouse, sometimes another community building in your area. You have the right to absentee vote, and which would be you have someone pick up your ballot if you won't be able to vote on election day, they could mail it to you. If you can't vote on election day or early voting due to absence or illness or physical disability, you can make arrangements with your county clerk for that. And then on election day, which is my favorite time to vote, you can go to your designated polling site during regular hours, which are usually 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. in Arkansas. But check, obviously, your polling location closer to time of the election. The reason I say that it's my favorite day to vote is because, you know, it, there's all the excitement of election day. I'm kind of an election nerd that way. So I think it's interesting to point out that when our founding fathers developed our Constitution and set forth our guidelines for voting, voting was not offered to everyone. And that's because they felt like some people had better knowledge and could cast a more educated vote. So obviously we know that that was not true and voting has opened up to minorities and to women since then. So now it's up to us to cast an educated vote. And here's how you do that. Read what you can about proposed ballot measures and candidates before you go vote. Make a list of pros and cons. Read other pros and cons. You know, read what other people say about them. Learn about the people who propose the issue or amendment, the people who are running for office. Learn everything you can about them and reach out to proponents or opponents if you have more questions. Usually, I mean, with electronic communications like they are now, I mean, you can usually use a chat box on a website or um, email to get answers right away from people. There are some good places to go to. I've included links for you in the slides, so you can just click on those and it'll take you to them. But if you're listening, one of the places that you can go is www.sos.arkansas.gov. The other, the other site is www.ballotpedia.org. And those two places will give you information about candidates who are running and measures that will be on your ballot. Also, when you are researching to develop your educated vote, keep your research, if you're going to look into the news, keep it with mainstream news outlets, ABC, CBS, NBC. Do not rely on CNN, Fox News, MSNBC. Those are news commentary 
stations, their political commentary, and they have a slant. They have a partisan slant. Some of the stations are getting better about offering an opposing viewpoint, but ultimately you're going to get one opinion there. And people love to be right, don't we? I mean, we love to be right. So we tend to listen to the one that already aligns with us. Don't do that when you're trying to decide who to vote for. You know, check out the main news outlets. Check a newspaper that you can trust. The Arkansas Democrat Gazette, you know, your local newspaper, if you still have one. Um, don't use social media. Don't rely on Facebook or Twitter. You know, Twitter is great. Facebook is good in one way because if your candidates are posting things themselves, you can get to know a little about them that way. I know I have seen some posts of some people that helped me decide that I wouldn't vote for them because I thought, you know, that stuff's just crazy. You know, that's, that stuff come out of any person. But anyway, so um, avoid blogs too. Blogs are just opinions and generally written to sway your opinion. And also avoid citizen journalists. That's when people take to um, the internet in order to share real news, and it's really not. So you've got to be careful of the news that you consume in order to make an educated vote. And for that reason, I really suggest www.sos.arkansas.gov and www.ballotpedia.org. Those are great resources to learn more information. And here are my sources for this information. You can check any of these out if you click on the slides that I've attached. And these links will take you right to where I got the information for this presentation. So I hope you learned something new about civic participation. It's not hard to get involved. You can make a difference in your community and your community can make a difference in you.